All righty. Welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I am an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington, and serving entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. and the world. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. I am so excited to bring you my new friend, but a friend of a friend, Brian Bogert today. Welcome, Brian. I'm just, I'm happy to be here, Heather. I mean, this was a long journey to get our, get our time together. So, you know, it, the universe is meant to happen and we're going to drop fire today. I'm sure of it. That's right. Well, we were laughing before we went live, like the planets must have aligned. We've tried yeah. multiple times to get our schedules to mesh up and Brian had a fire near his house. There was some crazy stuff going on before, but um, Brian, really good to have you here today. I'm so excited for folks that don't know Brian. Let me introduce his companies and then Brian individually. Uh, Brian company is called the Brian Bogert Companies LLC. It it is a human behavior and performance company that focuses on making people's best better. We identify ways, they identify ways for their clients to raise their level of awareness and intentionality to become who they already are, their most authentic selves. Their mission is to help their clients and growth-minded individuals learn this transformative approach that cultivates perspective, motivation, and direction to align personal goals that will defy expectations and bring joy, freedom, and fulfillment into all areas of life. They are on a mission to impact 1 billion lives by 2045. I love that summary. That's awesome, Brian. Um, Brian, as an individual, is a passionate human behavior and performance coach, speaker, business strategist, top sales professional, and philanthropic leader who believes in helping growth-minded individuals achieve the very best version of themselves, their most authentic self. He teaches how to leverage radical authenticity and awareness to create the intentional life you've been dreaming of but have struggled to create. His revolutionary strategy, Embrace Pain to Avoid Suffering, has helped individuals and companies break beyond their normal to achieve the success in life and business that they've always wanted. If you want to create a life of no limits and gain freedom, Brian and his team will get you there. And as I was mentioning, Brian was in, well, probably still is in fire country. He's down in the Phoenix area. So we were having chat about weather and fans, and you guys are probably up over 100 degrees, huh? We're 115 degrees today. <laughs> And anybody who's from Arizona will it, probably agree with this. I think anything over 110 all starts to feel the same. It's just <sighs> really hot. That's <laughs> so, brutal. Yeah, air conditioners struggle to keep up. It's it's one of those things. Oh my goodness. Well, so grateful that you are sweating it out. Your fans are on, which is awesome. We'll hopefully keep those on for you, but welcome. I'm so happy to have you, Brian. Yeah, I'm just, I'm you know, I feel blessed that you have built a platform to put good into the world and I've got the mm. opportunity to be with you. So it's going to be great. It is going to be great. And, you know, and I, you know, we have connected briefly before, but I, I think I mentioned the reason I launched my podcast last year in the middle of COVID is because I really thought like, gosh, COVID has hit. It's going to be rough on a lot of people and yeah. it's going to be really rough on a lot of entrepreneurs and small business owners. And uh, I've had a long standing relationship to grit and endurance and perseverance and all the things. And I thought, you know, maybe we could just add some interesting conversations to the marketplace that will keep people going and not giving up and staying on their path in life and in business. And so this podcast has conversations across all areas and both yeah. sides, right? You don't, you don't build one without the other. Yeah. Well, so I don't believe in work-life balance anyway. I believe in work-life integration. We've got one life. It's, you know, you got to put the focus where it needs at the time and it ebbs and flows naturally. And as long as you're intentional and you build your life of alignment, right? It becomes self-regulating. That's just how it works. So we can't just talk business. We can't just talk life. And anybody that's like, oh, I'm a business coach or I'm a life coach or I'm a health coach. Like you have to understand all the variables because it's in the aggregate that we really move and grow. That's right. It's well, and having that holistic view, even law, I look at the way that, I support providing legal structure and legal supports for businesses. Legal in and of itself, I consider a business system. It's one of the yeah. systems you plug into your business yeah. and it should integrate with all your other systems, right? Yeah. And life is the same way. So I, I love that, that there is no work-life balance, it's just work-life integration because otherwise, if you view it as somehow 
needing to be balanced or fitting in containers, I find that the frustration levels are just through the roof. Well, because you set yourself up for failure. Yeah. I mean, there's no way. I mean, balance inherently implies that, right? There's equal parts in certain places. And that's just not how life works, particularly for individuals that have to work, right? If they aren't someone who, who stays at home, which is a full-time job as well, by the way. So I don't in any way mean to minimize that. But yeah. if you are having to go out of your home for work, right, it's difficult. Yes. And, and, and if you're setting up with this idea of balance, it doesn't exist. Mm -mm. And so we just, it, it can't be looked at in terms of amount of time. It has to be looked at in quality of time. And where is your intention and your focus? Mm, I love that. Yeah, I've, I've tried to adopt like the, the way that I describe it. It's, it's a little bit like flow, but more like an arc. If I can look at the arc of my week and say mm -hmm. that overall there's balance or there's, you know, yeah, yeah. the blend of how I like things to be overall, goal accomplished. But day by day, day by day, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and not at all. And by the way, we just talked about this, right? I mean, yeah. perfect example is my last week, right? I typically put my, I have dinner with my kids and wife almost every night, five to six nights a week, unless I'm traveling or there's an event or something, right? And, and put them to bed almost every single night. Mm -hmm. Every single night since last Thursday, we had, a, we had an event. I was speaking. I had my team in town. We were running with different things. And literally Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and I was gone all weekend for the event. Sunday night, we had a team building event. Monday night, we had people at our house, right? And then it's so it's like, I have five to six nights now where it's completely flip flopped. Guess what? That means that as soon as that settles down, I double down on the other side because it's not about making up for it's just that that's been lacking in terms of how it's integrated into my life. It's, I'm out of alignment right now. Yeah. It's been hard. It's been difficult because my bucket gets filled with my family. So guess what? When it gets out of whack, we are the only ones who can bring it back into alignment. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's, yeah, I love that, that feeling of, of knowing like, okay, I'm out of alignment, but there's a path to get back. Right. Yeah. And again, it's, you know, doubling down or whatever it takes to make that reconnect. Uh, so Brian, I'm curious about your roots. I, I want to hear how, like where your path, you know, into whatever you call your field, human potential or whatever, you know, I'm not sure how you would sum it up in like just a couple words. Um, how you got started on that path. Yeah, so I I'm going to ask you and anybody who's listening or watching to just close your eyes for a second unless you're driving because we certainly don't want you doing that. Uh, keep your eyes open if you're driving. And I want you to imagine going to a store, having a successful shopping trip, breezing through the checkout lines. Like we all know what that feels like. It's easy. It's fun. It's great. Get through the door. You're walking outside. You look up. You feel the warmth of the sun on your skin. You feel the breeze through your hair. And you just are have a little pep in your step because you know you've got a great day ahead of you. You get up to your car, you're getting to grab your keys. And as you're going to unlock your door, you turn your head and you see a truck barreling 40 miles an hour right at you with no time to react. Go ahead and open your eyes. That's where this portion of my story begins. Mm. My mom, my brother and I went to our local Walmart to get a one inch paintbrush. And as we were headed to our car, I've always had an excitement and vigor for life. You could probably tell in the first couple of minutes of this, I've got a lot of energy. So of course it didn't surprise them. I was the first one to the car. I wanted to get home and put that paintbrush to use. And as I was standing there, my mom and brother who were only a few feet behind me, I was waiting for him to catch up and unlock the doors. But this was back in the day before key fobs. So there was no unlocking it. I had to wait for her to literally get the physical key, put it in the door, turn it so we go on with our way. And as I was standing there, a truck pulls up in front of the store, driver and middle passenger get out. And the passenger all the way to the right feels the truck moving backwards. So he did what any one of us would do. And he scooted over to put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. Combination of shock and force threw him up on the steering wheel, up on the dashboard. And before you know it, he was catapulting 40 miles an hour across the parking lot right at us with no time to react. Now we were in an end spot. So he goes in up and over the median. He goes up and over the tree in the median. He hits our car, knocks me over, runs over me diagonally, tears my spleen, leaves a tire track scar on my stomach, and continues on to completely sever my left arm from my body. So there I am laying on the parking lot on a 115 degree day in Phoenix, Arizona. My mom and brother watch the whole thing happen and they look up and they see my arm laying 10 feet away in the parking lot. Fortunately for me, my guardian angel also saw the whole thing happen. It was a nurse that walked out of the store right when this took place. And she came over because she saw the literal life and limb scenario in front of her and she chose to move into action. I'm forever indebted that she chose to do that versus turn her head and walk away. She came over and stopped the bleeding on the main wound and saved my life. 
And then she instructed some innocent bystanders to run inside, grab a cooler, fill it with ice, and put my detached limb on ice within minutes to give me a fighting chance of having it re attached. Mm. So Heather, had it not been for this woman, I either wouldn't be here with you today, or I wouldn't be here, or I'd be here today with a cleaned up stump. That's just mm. the facts. Mm. So I know I have a really unique story, and I know that probably you and others in, this, in, in the audience weren't expecting it to go there today. And, and, I, and the more I've done this, the more I realize that I'm not the only one with a unique story. We all have one. We all have unique stories. What's important is that we pause, become aware of the lessons we can extract from those stories, and then become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. So I'll share two primary lessons because this is going to lead you to how I got to where I'm at. Mm -hmm. The first is I learned not to get stuck by what has happened to me, but instead get moved by what I can do with it. Mm. And the second, I didn't realize right away. You see, at seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, although I was very aware of what was happening to me, although I was the one having the surgeries done to me, although I was the one having to put in the work in occupational and physical therapy, I was also in a fog because I was being guided through the process by my parents who were not in a fog. Mm. You see, they were intimately aware of the unceasing medical treatments, years of physical therapy. And the idea of seeing their son grow up without the use of his left arm was a source of great potential suffering for them. So they willed themselves day in and day out to do what was necessary, what was tough, to embrace the pains required to ultimately strengthen and heal me. So whether it was intentional or not, what they did was they ingrained in me a philosophy and a way of living, which was to embrace pain, to mm -hmm. avoid suffering. And I believe when this is done right, that's also where we gain freedom. Mm -hmm. So it was these two concepts that I used to not only overcome this unique injury, but how my business partners and I scaled our last business from zero to over 15 million within the span of a decade. And how now I flipped that on its head as a human behavior and performance coach to help individuals and organizations just like you, just like the people listening, do what you described in the bio, become more aware, more intentional in who they already are. You see, I believe that that's where joy, freedom, and fulfillment come in. And that's why we're on a mission to impact a billion lives. Because if we can reduce the level of suffering on this planet, allow people to truly experience joy, freedom, and fulfillment in their lives, that's also where the glue that binds human connection starts to come back in because vulnerability and authenticity, which are the glue that binds human connection, can exist. People can stand on their own two feet, confident in who they are and convicted in who they are and know that the world won't just accept them for who they are, but will embrace them for that. Mm. And this is what's going to make the world a more beautiful place for our kids and our grandkids, Heather. Oh, absolutely. Well, that phrase, you know, they are convicted in who they are. It's just so powerful. I mean, and if you've spent any time in the presence of somebody who really knows who they are, Versus somebody who like you feel that you feel that oh, yeah. difference, you know, it it emanates from somebody versus um, versus the opposite. And that's I mean, that is quite a story. You're right that it was probably not what most of us were expecting. <laughs> the talk to me about the, the concept of embracing pain. What does that what does that yeah. mean? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, first of all, the world literally tells us to reduce, eliminate or avoid pain. Like that's what we hear. That's the narrative. It's painkillers. It's numbing mechanisms. It doesn't matter. And oh, by the way, that's consistent with the natural evolutionary response, which was based in survival. A hundred years ago, you get a cut on your leg, you could die. Mm. That's not the world we live in anymore, but we're conditioned into it and we certainly lean into it. So we have to understand pain and we have to understand suffering to understand this concept. So pain is defined as short-term, intermittent, a direct cause from something and alleviates once that direct cause is removed. Mm -hmm. And what we do as humans is we screw it up by putting adjectives in front of it like we do with everything else, right? So we call, then call it acute pain and chronic pain. Well, acute maintains the definition, but chronic inherently changes it because it implies that it's no longer short term and it persists after the direct, direct, direct cause is removed. So can we just stop calling that chronic pain and call it what it really is? It's suffering. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't want to admit that suffering exists, particularly when it's a direct result of our choices. Right. But pain gets lots of attention because we feel it. We know it, it's there. The thing about pain that's difficult though, is it's subjective. It can't be measured independent of the person experiencing it. But there's one thing we know about pain. It's a universal human experience. Mm -hmm. So if we rephrase these things and we understand, okay, let's not call it chronic pain anymore. It's pain and suffering. What does this concept mean? We can embrace the pain of hitting the gym for 30 minutes a day to avoid the suffering of aches and pains of a sedentary lifestyle. We can embrace the pain of a difficult conversation with our spouse or loved one to avoid the suffering of a loveless marriage that's going to end in divorce or being stuck in a marriage when we want divorce. 
we can embrace the pain of the fit our kids are sure to throw by having them put down their uh, uh, <laughs> digital devices at the dinner table <laughs> to avoid the suffering of years of lost meaningful connection and conversation we'll never get back. And as business owners, because I always have to relate it to that, we can embrace the pain of firing our top salesperson who's contributing the most to top line growth to avoid the suffering of stagnant growth and, growth and losing all our other top talent because they're the greatest cancer in our culture. And this goes on, right? This goes on in every category of life, just like you said, it. it's work, it's personal, it's in service to others. When we truly start to recognize that pain is one of the critical tools to us getting freedom and to us actually being able to chase success, it starts to help us understand a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that we all must choose our pain or our suffering will choose us. Oh, totally. The, the thing that I find so interesting about pain and, you know, we all, I think even through our work, we're all trying to solve some sort of pain in the world, right? All yeah. of us are problem solvers in, in a specific niche or yeah. field. And the thing that's fascinating to me about pain, and I've, I've done some previous episodes on physical pain. I mean, yeah. you know, I haven't had a limb severed, but I've but had- But it's all kinds. It's, it's, it's physical, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's perceived. Right, all kinds. The, the comment that I was about to make was just that when we have pain present, man, are we motivated to do something about it, right? Like when it's there, it's yeah. like, okay, I think then the fire gets lit. Yeah. But talk to me about the part of human nature that is less inclined to take action until yeah. pain arrives, right? Because I think sometimes, and it's, you know, it's just how life works. Sometimes we don't make those dramatic, even internal shifts until yeah. something really dramatic happens that forces it. Yeah. Right. Talk, talk to me about that dynamic, because I think most most people and I would guess that anybody listening, you can look around in your life and see people that are proactive about their pain versus the folks that, for lack of a better word, let's just say stay asleep for a time until they mm -hmm. get the brick in the face and then are responsive to the pain. But yeah. I, I, you know, my personal opinion is that more people fall into that second bucket. Yeah, so 100% agree. And I think you said something that was really powerful, which is essentially my answer. I think pain points us at what's important. Pain gives us perspective, mm -hmm. right? But often we don't necessarily recognize pain, meaning we're not aware of pain, right? We aren't aware of those pains, particularly if they're an emotional pain or a spiritual right. pain or something, because we're, the narratives of the world is to just shove that down and show up with a smile on our face. So we yeah. literally just suppress things, yes. right? To a point where, to your point, a brick in the face causes us to see it and we're like, oh crap, I need to make some changes. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons that I say so often, and there's two things I'm gonna say here, but the first is our minds process 11 million bits of information per second, but we're only consciously aware of about 40. Why don't you so say What that, that suggests literally is that we are largely led by the unconscious, which is not a surprise why people feel like they're a victim, like they feel like life is fate, like they have no influence or control of their destinies. Because until you go through a systematic process of moving the unconscious to the conscious, the unaware to the aware, guess what? You can't be intentional with anything. Yeah. And so it's of course going to feel like you are a victim in fate. The second side of this is that so many people, because they lack awareness, don't truly understand the meaning of why they need to move. We're taught to mask. We're taught to show up with a smile. And so the thing that I'm going to say is that so often people think they're stuck, stymied in the rest of their potential, feel like a victim or fate, not just because of lack of awareness, but because the narrative of the world is also, you have the wrong strategy and tactics in your life. Mm -hmm. If you just do X, you will be happier. If you just do X, you will have less pain. What I know definitively, this is my belief. What I know definitively is what actually keeps people stuck. It's not strategy and tactics. They're really important, but they're only going to get you so far. It's a combination of emotional triggers, behavioral patterns, and environmental conditioning that keep people in that self-defeating place. Mm -hmm. So until something hits them in the face where they realize, oh, wow, I'm not just in a great amount of pain, but I'm maybe even suffering, they don't really get the initiative to do much about it. Yeah, so true. So a couple things. One, the emotional triggers. I think a lot of people get stumped right there. Yeah, right? they do. They, they don't. And I mean, as parents, we all get to examine our own emotional triggers, right? They're like on display yeah. <laughs> on the daily. Always, yeah. 
right? We really learn to reparent ourselves through our children. And so the emotional triggers, like we can go way deep down in that road. But I think that, um, that you're right. It starts there and it also can stop there for a lot of people. It can. Yeah. It can. How and, and I think it's because they get stuck in a certain part of the process. So I've developed this idea that I believe over the years of working with this, right? I think that so many people take the outside in approach to emotional triggers, mm -hmm. right? Which is where they react. But if you take the inside out approach, it allows you to respond. So help me, I'll help you understand what this concept is, right? Because I think that's what we really want. Emotional triggers cause us to react or respond. By the way, a trigger is designed to be pulled, right? So you can either be pulled by your emotional triggers or you can pull the trigger on your emotional triggers, mm -hmm. right? So it's your choice, you can choose. The inside out method that we developed, I think that most people go through the first two stages if they are aware of it. And the first step is literally become aware. What's the emotion that you're feeling? Is it shame? Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it guilt? Right? No, by the way, I believe that the greatest, most common emotional trigger is shame based. Yes. Shame is the ultimate wolf in sheep's clothing because it manifests and shows up as so many different things. Okay. Oh, totally. But, like Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was gonna say like anger, I feel like is a very common emotion that, you know, yeah. many of us experience, but that's really masking a much deeper. Yeah, anger is not a rude emotion. It's it's a default no. emotion. It, you yes. go to it as a result to cover up something else. Right, you, either yep. sadness or shame or something that's much, much deeper. 100%. So aware is the first step. Like we have to be aware. So we need to start to understand what emotion or emotional triggers exist in our world. And I'm a firm believer that if each one of us truly knew the top one or two emotional triggers that have affected our lifetimes. And we were able to normalize it through conversation, bring it to awareness. Like that is the singular thing that would free people. I believe that. And I've witnessed it in the work that we do with high performers. Mm -hmm. So aware is the first step. The next step is ownership. We literally need to own it. We need to a, a, a literally acknowledge. Yep. Okay. I'm affected by shame. Yep, my shame has actually caused me to react in moments and has actually caused damage for other people in my life. Mm -hmm. So ownership looks like I need to accept it to myself, but it also means I need to accept it with the people in my life, whether it's coworkers, family, friends, right? We have to live into it and own it. By the way, that's where I think most people stop. Well, that part is hard. That It's hard, I, but that's where most people get and then stop. Right, right. And, and I think if I were, to, and I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on, you know, all of this that you're talking about, but... My guess is that that cycle of taking ownership and actually realizing like what you're doing is inflicting harm on other, like triggers the shame cycle all over it again. It does. And that's why it's really important to go beyond. Yes. But that's where most people stop. And you're right. Ownership, by the way, aware is hard, but it's yeah. way easier than ownership. Right. Ownership is really difficult, right. like really difficult, but a lot of people get there. But you're right. It keeps them cycling. Okay. Yes. The next steps where it really starts to come to fruition, we got to unroot. Mm. We literally need to understand the root or roots of that emotion. Okay. So is it, is my shame based on the fact that I was always compared to my sibling when I was growing up? Is my shame because I grew up in a really tight religious environment that kept me confined and right what I was doing, right? Shame shows up as you should do this. You should be that. You should be that. You shouldn't do that. You should chase this amount of money, right? Yeah. And so it implies that whatever you're doing isn't good enough. Shame based. Mm. So we need right. to unroot it, right? Literally get to the root or roots because that also helps you understand in those moments, is it because my wife looked at me incorrectly because I loaded the dishwasher wrong or was it because that's how my grandma looked at me when I was five, hmm. right? It's, it's typically not having anything to do with the moment. Right. So you have to get to the root or roots. Most people don't do that. Hmm. And by getting to the root or roots, what you're allowed to do then is move into movement. And what that means is, is once you identify it, movement is how does this emotion move in my body? And how do I move through it? Because, oh, by the way, shame shows up in multiple different ways for multiple different people. So literally, how does an emotion manifest, right? Do I feel a pit in my stomach? Do I feel sweating? Do I feel a, a heat wave over? Does my mouth dry out? Do I start chewing my lip? Like legitimately, like it shows up different. Yeah. I've suffered deeply from shame. I have about mm -hmm. six different shame triggers in the way that they actually manifest in my body. Mm -hmm. So I had to understand that because once I understand in the moment how I'm feeling it, I can start to identify what triggers that feeling. Oh, absolutely. Again, I have six different ways it manifests in my body and about a hundred different ways I'm triggered by it. And yeah. so then you can start tying patterns to, okay, when I get this pit in my stomach around shame, this is what starts to take place. When someone tells me that I talk too fast or I'm too loud, I want to shrink myself to make myself small. When my wife starts to get on me about something that 
she's just implying I could slightly improve or I could be thoughtful of as a husband or father, I immediately go to defensiveness because that's the most important role for me. And I list off the 10 things that I did in the last four days that made me a great husband and father because that defensiveness, I can prove it. No, I'm a great husband and father, right? But these are all triggers mm -hmm. and we've got to understand how do they show up and then where do we get triggered? Because it's in those moments that we can pause and ask ourselves: is what I'm experiencing in the moment true to my belief system and how I show up? Or is it something that's rooted beyond? Mm -hmm. And then I can also pause and choose in those moments to choose a different path and create a new pattern. Yeah, well, that creating the new pattern, I mean, must just feel like absolute freedom for somebody that has been caught in the trigger cycle yeah. and then the behavioral patterns, right? Yeah. That are generally a result of that cycle. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about the relationship between emotional triggers, behavioral patterns, right? And then I think the third one was our environmental conditioning yep. or our environmental yep. stuff. So I, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer your question, but I want to really hit outside in because it's critical to understand. Yes. Okay. Because outside in, I, I wish I could show you, it's like a bullseye target, right? Like literally aware, own, unroot, and then movement. But yes. if you look at it from the outside in, this is, this is what actually happens. We're literally going to go outside in through that bullseye. Mm. Movement is actually masking. Yeah. The world tells us to act. The world tells us to react. It tells us to shove our stuff down, show up with a smile on our face. We mask. When we mask or we numb, we don't unroot. We further root in those behavioral patterns. They become more concrete. They become more conditioned. They become more a part of who we are. When we do that, we don't get ownership. We actually become the victim in that state. So if we go a layer deeper, right, we now become a victim. No wonder people feel like victims because we mask, we further root in bad behavioral patterns, and then we become a victim. Mm. And aware is no longer aware. We're blinded. And yeah. So you're talking about the opposite. The of all of us, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's the exact opposite, but it's important to understand that because that's where we can start to separate between the two. Got it. And you're make saying... an intentional choice. Right. Typical response is this outside in approach. Yep. The and reverse. I'm trying to teach the world a new way to process mm -hmm. and normalize emotions because mm -hmm. it has to happen. Yeah. Well, the relationship we... between emotional triggers and behavioral patterns and environmental conditioning. Yeah. And let's, before we get there though, because there was one other thing in your um, inside out approach that I want to emphasize, yeah, 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 yeah. which is the relationship between our emotions and how we feel in our bodies, this, the physical self, mm. right? Because I think so many of us in different ways have the experience of being conditioned out of our bodies and being conditioned to literally disconnect from self that like this is a whole new thing actually yeah. slowing down long enough to say, how is it that I'm actually feeling? What is this, right? What, yeah. what is this that I'm feeling? Talk to those folks who have had a long time experience of being disconnected from their physical selves. Yeah, and, and by the way, I was one of those people. Uh, when I shut off physical pain, I also shut off emotional pain. And for 25 years, I didn't have emotional pain, meaning I didn't feel it. I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was inside of me. And my wife joked for 10 years, dude, you don't feel anything. And I'm like, no, inside I'm, but inside I'm feeling all this stuff. But the outside, it was either a reaction or just blank because I didn't know what it was. So mm -hmm. I want to just say and own it. Like I'm sitting here teaching this now but like I didn't feel for 25 years. And so this is a path and a progress that I'm teaching because I had to go through it. Yeah. So often we don't know, which is why I say when we do the outside in, we mask, mm -hmm. right? We, we root, we become a victim and we're blind. I'm going to give you a really real time example of myself. Okay. And I'll keep this story short because I, I want you to understand. March 4th, 5th, and 6th, I would have told you that my wife and I, after 14 years together, we were in the best place we'd ever been in our marriage, the happiest we'd ever been in our marriage. And like we were in for the long haul, more connected, more spiritual, more intimate, all these things. Then we started to unpack some stuff. And we became aware of a whole lot of things, patterns, emotional triggers, environmental conditioning in ourselves that was there. And I'm not going to talk about both sides of it. Her story is her story to tell. I'm going to own mine. Okay. It was about a month into this by April 4th, 5th, and 6th. I didn't know if I was going to be married for another month. And I certainly didn't know if I'd be married by the end of the year. And what got unpacked in that is my wife owned her truth. I'm literally sitting here today as someone who's telling you I'm committing my life to helping people discover who they are. And my wife, after 14 years, was finally able to articulate that some of the things I did early in our marriage that were based in temper and control 
12 to 14 years ago caused her to lose who she is. Mm. That was a soul hit. Mm. Okay. More conversations took place. And again, I had to be aware. I had to own it. I could have reacted in that moment and concreted in her mindset, the belief system that she had, which is no longer true and hasn't been for a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then we started to have more conversations. And about a week later, I discovered I've been angry for a long time. Mm. And I never knew I was angry. Truthfully, like it was buried so deep, it could barely be excavated, Heather. Yeah. So deep. And when I actually moved to the ownership stage and I started literally within a matter of days communicating to people outside of my household, they were like, you're not an angry person. We've never seen you be angry, right? Because I had learned and contained it so tight and buried it so deep that guess what? The only person in the world that felt it was my wife. Mm. And that didn't always come up as I'm being abusive. I'm not screaming. I'm not right. mad. I'm not, but I would get triggered and I'd get this edge about me. Guess what? You don't have a personality and an energy like I do and not have everybody in a room feel it if you're in a bad mood. Oh, right? I, well, I get Except it. Except for me. I was the only one. <laughs> I was blind. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's a great example. And I appreciate you sharing something so intimate and recent. I think, um, well, one, just the year that COVID has created for a lot of, there's been a lot of breakdowns, right? There's been a lot of people going to hard places and ending up in hard places, even though they didn't feel it was their choice to get there. And I mean, even some parallels in my own marriage with what you're talking about, I think it's really easy for us in the pace of modern life yeah. to do exactly what you're talking about, which is to muffle ourselves or, or not fully express, not emote, not let things move right. through you know, just because we're trying to hold it together or we're, right. we are in survival mode or we've got, you know, you're a dad, you're a husband, you're a business owner, right? You've got all these hats and these things right. you've got to keep in the air. And, you know, I'm sure my husband could relate to so much of what you say because same thing, there sometimes is an edge that comes out and, you know, we yeah. all have it. You don't have to necessarily even have a huge personality like you do for people to feel it. And, and that's what is so important about our emotions is that when they are not expressed and allowed to move through, yeah. they leak out in other yeah. ways, often Absolutely. Ways and more toxic than Absolutely. Want. And so yeah. I just, that's a real- Yeah, because when you, don't, when you don't understand it, when you, don't, when you aren't aware, you don't own it, you don't unroot it, and you don't move through it, literally you're reacting, you're not responding, mm -hmm. right? And so it's, it's different and reacting typically causes damage to you or those yeah. around you. And, and that's just the truth. So I will, I will say for everybody who's listening, my wife and I, because of what I do and what we do together, we were able to take what I would consider decades of healing and compress it into yeah. days or weeks. And we, awesome. I won't bore uh, everybody with that, but I do want everybody to know, like, so we don't leave that <laughs> story open. We're <laughs> right. literally standing here today and we genuinely believe we've embraced the pains required to avoid the suffering in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I genuinely believe just to what you said, so much suffering exists from what's left unsaid what we're unaware of that can't have words or what we feel, but we don't feel valid or have the words to describe. This is it's right. Those three things that create so much suffering in our world. Yes. And so when you talked about the relationship with emotional triggers, behavioral patterns, and environmental conditioning, I'll bring yep. it back full circle. Yep. Okay. They all matter and they all feed off each other and complement each other. This is my belief. I'm not saying this is studied. This is my belief. I think you can reverse engineer behavioral patterns and environmental conditioning if you understand your trigger. Yeah. I think you can acknowledge behavioral patterns and environmental conditioning, but I'm not sure you can get to the core, which to me is emotional triggers. I think the emotional triggers is the tip of the spear mm -hmm. and behavioral patterns and environmental conditioning shape them. They condition them. They can alter them, but you can also alter your patterns and you can also alter your conditioning. It's mm -hmm. much more difficult to alter your triggers because you never escape them. You never escape those emotions. Their adversaries always in constant pursuit. The thing is when you move through them, they trigger you less often. Yeah. They are less damaging on the back end because you get to respond versus react. You're aware of them. You can be intentional with them, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's so critical. We need to normalize emotional triggers because if that was in our business, in our relationships, in our politics, in our sports, and we truly could just acknowledge that we're all, we all have them. We're all affected by them, right? We all walk around with little buttons. We all walk around with them. Yeah. But if we can normalize that and it's like, hey, you know, when you did that, it made me trigger. And that's not your fault, right? It, it, and, and it might not be my fault either, but is it potentially both of our responsibility mm -hmm. if we want to enhance this relationship? Mm -hmm. And the answer is almost always yes. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. We avoid. 
Well, and this, you know, this concept of emotional triggers, I'm curious what your thoughts are, because I think there's a, a variety of ways that you can find in the marketplace that people teach on emotional triggers, right? This idea of um, really doing shadow work, right? Mm -hmm. Examining what is it that generally we're trying to avoid something, right? When we're triggered. So let's say that it's shame-based and that we had a parent that got after, like I look at my son who is ADHD, right? And I have a husband who I suspect at a young age was ADHD. And I was recently part of a panel. It was in, actually in regards to Enneagram work, different yep. than what we're talking about here, but type one and what stood out, we were a panel of ones. And what stood out about his childhood experience that he shared was that uh, he had a dad who anytime his energy got a little out of bounds or he started doing something that was a little too crazy or he got just like a little bit, you know, too much. Like he, you know, something was usually breaking or he, you know what I mean? Yeah. His dad would freak out. And so he, as an adult, has a really hard time like being fully himself and fully yeah. embodied and like 100%. can never let himself have too much fun. Right. And Part of me was even triggered hearing that, thinking about probably my husband's experience yep. as a kid, my own son's experience as a kid. Like when we go out into social settings or, you know, even on the yeah. streets of Seattle, he was a two-year-old that refused to hold my hand yeah. in busy traffic and we just have to leave. I'd be like, okay, yeah. we can't walk to the Space Needle today. <laughs> yeah. Right? But, but I think you're exactly right. So much is in the, in, in the history. It's in the things that have shaped us. It's in those interactions. And that's typically how we start with all of our clients that we do one-to-one -one work with is literally like start at the beginning, as yeah. far back as you can remember, right? And we start to unpack from there because so often we really do find that those things are deeply rooted. They are things that we're unaware of, right? And, and, and I'll give you a couple of examples so that people can relate. And Emotional triggers, right, look like a 50-year-old woman who's a very successful entrepreneur, very successful lawyer, but never made over a quarter million dollars a year, which again, to a lot of people is a lot of money, but she always wanted to make what she called a shitload of money, which was way more than that, right? And when we actually started to unpack and really unravel what this is, what we started to realize is that she had allowed the voices of the men in her life to drown out her own voice. It was based in shame. It was based in conditioning. It was based in all these things. And so she wasn't ever allowing herself to live into who she was authentically, own her voice. And when she started to move through that, guess what? It was only 18 months before she blew through the, her number. Okay. Yeah. Emotional triggers looks like a 29 year old male who had a very successful business. He was in the hospitality business, restaurants, bars, hotels, successful, multiple people working for him. But he was always told that what he wanted to do wasn't good enough, which wasn't what he was doing. Right. And so when we started to unpack these things, he ended up selling his business, going and get his EMT and became a firefighter, right? It wasn't about the money for him. It was about saving and impacting lives. It looks like a 43 year old male who literally had no self-worth for his entire life, right? One of the master communicators on the planet, building other people's brands for 25 years and described himself as the wizard behind the curtain. Guess what? Once he started to understand his self-worth, he's stepping out from behind that curtain and owning his gift as his own, not to build other people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I'll leave you with one more. It was a 68 year old man who's financially independent. He literally, I mean, today he's a consultant and a coach and a business consultant, all the above self-worth. He never realized that it's 68 years old. It's impacted his relationship. It's impacted their pricing in the marketplace. It's impacted his business relationships. It's impacted his community relationships all throughout his whole life. He never saw it and never aware of it. And so I look at that and I say, 68 years old, he's been suffering for 50 years, wow. highly successful, happy life, happy wedding, like happy family, all the above, but always felt stuck and empty inside. And once he started to move through this and own the root of his self-worth, lack of self-worth, guess what? All those things have started to right size. I can give you a hundred more examples, but those are four because I want people who are listening. Look, it's in all of us. We all right. have it. Right. And to yeah. your point, that's how we have to discover it. We got to look backwards. We have to do that historical work, multi-generational often. It's yes. not just our experience. It's our parents and our grandparents because that's, right. that's how we break generational cycles because they literally are embedded in us. Yes. I mean, genetically, uh, it's, there, it's both the genetics and the nature. Right. I mean, the nurture, right. right? So the, but I, I feel like if we can figure out what it is that we're trying so hard to avoid, right? Because the triggering is really about avoiding some right. perceived, 
some really perceived painful yeah. outcome, right? Are right. we going to be told we're a bad kid? Is somebody going to not love us anymore? Like what is the terrible outcome that we're afraid yep. of, right? And really own that. Like, okay, so what if somebody, like to the people who are the Energizer Bunny workaholics, you know, I think we yep. have a lot of them. Like my self-worth comes from getting stuff done. It just, right. I just have to go, go, go. Like what's the worst that can happen? So somebody exactly right. calls you lazy, like, yeah. okay, what what if some part of you is late? You know, so it, it is, I think- really But people don't do the work to figure that stuff out. And, yeah. and, and oh, by the way, if, so the, there's, I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm gonna hit them high level and quick. Yeah. But the process to, to understand how to embrace pain to avoid suffering in your life is just yeah. that. We gotta start by acknowledging the suffering we wish to avoid, right? And, and when I say suffering, that's like, literally, what is the suffering I wish to avoid? So I'll give you an example, okay? Because by the way, this is a two-sided coin. People talk about goals, planning, right? Where do we wanna go? That's great, but we need to bookend it. We also need to understand what do we wanna avoid? Because it's really where those two come together, the two sides of the same coin that really start to move us. 38-year-old client moved 26 times before the time he was 18. Lived with his mom, grandma, dad, right? All over the place. Never had the same set of friends twice. Never went to the same school twice. He literally never learned how to give or receive love. Mm. Fast forward to today. He's got a beautiful wife and two beautiful daughters but he never learned how to give or receive love. And he was a nomad. And whenever things got tough, they'd pack up and walk away. So that was what he was conditioned to do, but he Gosh. never even thought about it that way, right? And so the idea of acknowledging the suffering for him is a life without his wife and two girls, right? But what he really wants is this very vivid image of his wife and him sitting on their ranch in Texas when they're 80 years old with the wind blowing through the brush. And the only thing breaking the silence is the laughter of his kids and his grandkids playing in the fields. Mm. And when he takes that image and he burns it into his soul, right? The purpose becomes big enough to overtake the pains required for him to change, mm. right? So that's the suffering that's the long-term. But the next step is to identify the pains we tend to avoid and learn to embrace them. Yes. I'll use a personal example on this one. My arm, I told you, I don't have a tricep. My biceps, my gracilis from my leg. I don't have a lat in the left side of my back. I have a curve in my spine. I've had chronic suffering I put chronic in front of suffering because that's been the truth in my back my whole life. 15 years ago, I discovered that if I stay lean, I stay active, I stay moving, and I focus on my core and my back strength, that I can alleviate that suffering into a manageable pain. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I did what all of us do when we want to get healthy. I went and I joined a gym. And I went consistently for 30 days. And then I stopped going. Now, that's where most people stop. And I, it's only because I had done the work of acknowledging the suffering, and I know this because I'm working through it, that I was like, I need to ask myself one more question. Is it the pain of working out? Is it the pain of lifting weights, the pain of cardio, the pain of stretching that I'm avoiding? Or is it the anxiety I got in that crowded gym? Mm. It was definitively the second. Yeah. So I had to embrace the pains required to create the time, energy, space, and money to build out my own home gym so I could have my environment for success. Mm, because the reality that. of it was, again, that wasn't a strategy or a tactic, which the gym was. It was yeah. an emotional trigger. I was getting anxiety because I knew I didn't perform my best in that environment. Mm. So... Those are the first two steps in that process, but it hits right on the point that you talked about, which is why I had to share those two stories. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, continuing to ask ourselves these important questions. I think we just can't stop asking because that's how we get to the root of, that's Right. are we that's avoiding, exactly right. right? Is it this, is it something else? And like what a, probably in your life, a relatively easy change for you once you had the recognition of like, right. oh, I just need a new environment for this. Yeah. Well, and even with anger, I mean, it was one of those things that I owned it. I was right in it. And I promised my wife that's on that spot in that moment where I said, you will never feel the negative manifestation of anger from me in our household ever again. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't happened in six to eight weeks since it happened. Now I'm not committing that it will never, I promised her, right. so I'm going to fulfill it. But you're right. That's, that's really it. And, you know, I believe like there's a whole lot to this clearly. I mean, we're talking about it to give granular details in a way that people can experience. I talk fast because when I come on these things, I want to cram as much value into this as I possibly can. And I have a lot of energy, so I move through it. But, but that's the truth, right? It's like, once you start to do this, by the way, that's the third step in embracing pain to avoid suffering is establishes a habit in every area of our life. Yeah. Right. The problem is, is when we look at these things, we view it as a cost. We view it as an expense. It's gone. Oh, it sucks to get up at five. Well, it sucks to do this. I don't want to stop watching Netflix. Right. And even experts in habit formation call it an upfront energy tax. Well, Let's exactly. That. Flip it on its head. Let's start looking at it as an investment in our future self. Because when we can do that and we understand the purpose is greater than the pain. Right. We understand the pains we need to embrace and we can do this as a habit. It starts to become easy. 
It's not right. something that we have to take a lot of effort around anymore. Well, we, we probably should schedule a whole separate conversation just on habits. Yeah, habit formation, changing all right. Because I feel like a lot of people get stuck there. It's you, do. you know, I, I read Changeology a few years back that talks Good about, yeah, yeah, it's a great one. And like, I think so many people have the right heart for, you know, developing change and wanting to create a new healthier habit. And they just don't have the right supports in place or they're out of the, the phasing and or the timing or whatever is out of alignment. They're missing some of what makes successful habits last, right? Or yeah. easier to form. But um, the, you've given some really good examples because, you know, the, the part I really want people to hear is this importance around what it actually takes to embrace pain. What does that look like? I mean, you've shared some concrete examples around that because it does... We all have ample opportunity in our life for pain. And it's interesting how some seem to have more than others. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it does. But I think the life and, and universe, you know, regardless of religion and spiritual beliefs, like <laughs> it throws at you what you can handle. And that's not to suggest that if you have less, you can't handle it. It might just not be in your cards, but typically the people that get it can handle it, yeah. right? And so it, it is what it is. Yeah. And it's it's not an equitable equation, but when when we, you know, the whole, the whole phrase right like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger mm -hmm. yes it's antiquated but it's also a challenge of perspective because it calls us to see our pain through a lens of meaning yeah and so for those that have carried maybe or had more weight in their lives more pain in their lives as a result of it right if you can truly become aware of the lessons you can extract from those stories those painful experiences mm -hmm. and then become intentional with how you plan in your lives you're stronger for it you're better for it you have more perspective you literally are in a position where you also can understand the patterns, see them and free yourself as they start to creep in. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm one of those that you know, our, our therapist was joking with us. And that was literally what she said. She goes, well, you guys took like decades and compressed it into days. And we were like, yeah, I mean, it is. But it was also because she's like, you know how in the Bogart household to turn pain into purpose yeah. and turn pain into meaning and turn pain into perspective to keep you moving. Yeah. Well, and that, that turning pain into meaning and purpose is really a significant piece of it because without that, I think people just can wallow. They can really stay stuck. And I, it, I really feel like this gets us back full circle to one of the things you said at the very beginning of our time together where you said, get moved by what you can do with it, right? Don't stay yeah. stuck when you can get to the point where you get moved by what you can do with that experience or that pain, um, you know, that is how we can create meanings. In, in my mind, it's not even necessarily sometimes about finding it yeah. as it is creating meaning for that particular experience. 100%. That, right. And um, 100%. yeah, but that's why the last step is movement as well. Cause we got to get totally. moved by it because yes. here's the thing, Heather moved people, move people. Yeah. And then there's a ripple effect. Right. No, I love that. I think a lot of people are <laughs> familiar with the other similar quote, hurt people, hurt people, right? You're right. Yeah. Moved people, move people. And that's, that is what we need. It's what we need way more of. Uh, Brian, you're awesome. I love this. This has been such a fun conversation. It feels like we've had 10 minutes and it's been much longer than 10 minutes. Um, we should definitely schedule a round two, but for folks, yeah, for folks that are still with us, where where do you like to connect with people online? Where should they go find you? So you can find me at any of my, my on social. It's at Bogert Brian on any of the platforms. Um, but I also want to say you can go to brianbogert.com. It's the main website for all of our companies and entities. Um, and I'm going to say this, right? We are on a mission to impact a billion lives. We are very aware that 99.9999999% of those billion people will never pay us a single dollar. We're very okay with that. And the reason I say that is, is we create a lot of content, which is literally designed to elevate and empower people. The website's a good representation. You see a lot of the content, YouTube channels, Bogart's Bullets, vlog stuff that we do to show what No Limits Living looks like, articles, all of the above. Take them, consume them. If they're all you need, take them and run. Here's my one request. If anything resonates, if anything hits you, please like, comment, and share because it's gonna be a collective impact that gets us to that billion lives mm -hmm. and we need all the help we can get. So we're putting a lot of this out there, not for us, but literally for you. And so please, if you consume it and something resonates, if you don't like it, don't. But if, if it resonates, please share it to somebody that can benefit from it. 
And if there's anything we can do to help you further, say the word how, because we want to explore that. Mm, I love that. So if you're interested in no limits living, I love that phrase and um, learning more about what Brian's up to, just so we're clear, his last name is Bogert, B-O-G-E-R-T. Thank so, you, Heather. <laughs> I want them to be doing <laughs> the right search online and not looking for a Bogart. <laughs> um, Brian, do you spend any time on social? Where's your favorite place on social for people to find you? I am on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn very frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the same stuff goes, and I engage on all platforms. So awesome. um, anyway, and again, that's why I said at Bogart Brian on pretty much any of them, you'll find me. Perfect. And we will share those links both to your website and all of your social media handles at our show notes. So find Brian and all of his resources at legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast. Brian, thank you so much for being here. What is, aside from the going and engaging with your awesome content, what is one final takeaway you would say to anybody who's still listening? Yeah. Well, thank you if you're still listening, because that tells me that there was at least value already to this point. Um, you know, I, I'm in the process of helping usher in the era of who. The reality of it is we've been so conditioned for so long to chase the what. What house, what car, what amount of money, right? What literally city we live in, what zip code, that all will make us be accepted by the world. Mm -hmm. I chased the what. Yeah. I got all of the what's. And then I woke up one day and I realized that I was miserable and run in circles with making multiple six figures, seven figures, eight figures with so many other people that were miserable. Mm -hmm. And it's because when you chase the what, you lose the who. Yeah. And so when we come back to recalibrate with the who, which is all about shedding the layers the world has put on us, and we identify exactly who we are, who we're doing this for, who we're serving, then all the what's in our world become a manifestation of the who. So mm -hmm. it's not that what doesn't matter, it's that it's who before what. Yeah. And so we are really trying to normalize this conversation because when you meet someone new, what's the first question they ask you? What do you do? Right. And if you just wanna throw somebody for a loop and you ask them who they are, 98% of people still answer with what they do because we're so conditioned. Why don't we start asking who people are? Let's focus on people over profits, people before profits, not instead of profits, people before profits. Yeah. Let's focus on who before what. And I guarantee you that if you do that, you're not only gonna live a more joyful, free and fulfilled life, but you're gonna have a greater amount of connection in your world and you're gonna help us usher in this era of who. Mm -hmm. I love that, Brian. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Heather. <laughs>